UFOs, and Mitch Horowitz. The Miracle Club. Enjoy. Percolate on a particular mix of odd and inspiring news headlines, UFOs, ghost encounters, near-death experiences, and more. And now, here's Wendy. From that to this wonderful UFO story, I also have a guest, Mitch Horowitz. If you have ever considered what manifesting will do for you, this is like a primer with all the new thought people lined up, ready to go, and to give you good advice, and then he gives you basically why it works and how it works. The Miracle Club. Mitch Horowitz is my guest. Mitch, are you there? I am here. Can't wait. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Have I got your interest? Okay, it's UFO. The, the moment you say UFO story, I'm hooked, so I'm, I'm okay. sitting on the edge of my sofa. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The deal is with this, that it, the, the story, I think I saw it over the weekend, and I kind of discounted it because they were saying, well, it's meteorites. So I didn't go back. And then one of my Facebook friends said, hey, check this out. So I went back and I looked at it. And then I saw the update from another source that actually had audio. This is when it got interesting. This was a UFO sighted by a British, I believe, the British Airways pilot and reported by the BBC. And it happened, I think, Friday. And I'm going back to my notes here. Made contact with Ireland's Shannon Air Traffic Control. Said they saw something weird. They wanted to the military exercise is taking place, and that's the Irish Aviation Authority, has decided to investigate because they had multiple accounts. They saw bright lights and UFOs or UAPs moving at uh, high speed of whatever. Mach 2, I think, is one of the ones that they mentioned, coast of Ireland on Friday. Okay, so what happened was then they went to somebody who would be more of an astronomical, somebody who, who might say it's a meteorite because they needed that. So they got that. Oh, it's a meteorite. And then the pilots, and one of the pilots actually said, well, maybe it's a meteorite. Listen to the audio, because this is where it gets interesting, and this is why it reappeared in the news feeds to say, wait a minute. All right, here we go. Uh, Sounds stupid, my fool. Direction it was going in or anything. Trace copy, thank you. Uh, The Virgin 76 also saw that in our 11 o'clock position. Uh, Two bright lights. Roger, that's copy, thank you. Glad it wasn't just me. No, uh, yeah, very interesting, that one. Say again. Hey, thank you. Yeah, uh, Virgin 76. I saw uh, two bright lights at 11 o'clock seem to um, back over to the right and then uh, climb away at uh, the speed, at least from our perspective. Okay, we're passing that on now, thank you. Speed right 94, Shannon. 94, go ahead. Okay, just so you know that uh, other aircraft in the air have also reported the same thing, so we're going to have a look and see. Okay, so that's the deal. These are the pilots, mm. the pilots talking about this. And what the thing that it didn't marry up with a meteorite was that it was flying alongside the aircraft, a very bright light, mm. and then rapidly veered off to the north. It veered. Meteorites usually have like a straight, traje- well, I'm sorry, maybe I'm misinformed, a straight trajectory unless they burst into little mm-hmm. pieces and then go haywire. What do you think about that? Meteorites don't turn. That's what I was taught in college. Okay, good. If I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah. Very At college, yeah. It's been a while. All Second right. Second time recently that, I, that I've heard um, uh, cockpit recordings of fighter pilots recently encountering UFOs. It's fascinating to hear. Well, and that was back in March, I think, was one of the other ones they talked about. And this is Oregon. And I've got that same channel. They're the ones who go back and get that audio from the pilots. And I love it because then you can hear. What happens with a news yeah. story is a lot of times people just regurgitate and it gets repeated and repeated. But there's nobody back there doing, you know, the boots on the ground of, well, what happened here? It, because that takes a little bit more right. time. But, uh, yeah, this is like the second time this year they have this kind of thing. And I'm just thinking the other pilot said that there were several objects seen alongside. And so they were saying, well, it must have burst. And it was probably a bright, bright lean light, green light they just couldn't see from that vantage point. And I was thinking Kenneth Arnold. Yes. And this also reminds me of the stories of Foo Fighters from the Second World War, where fighter pilots would report spherical objects flying alongside their plane and then turning. It's, it's very reminiscent of that. See, I just, because in your book at the very back, which I was thrilled to see, here it is, <laughs> Mitch Hurwitz, of, okay, the book, The Miracle Club, in case you want to read along, How Thoughts Become Reality, it is in the back, okay, page 176, you have to look for this stuff. <laughs> 
All the right. Page 176. Yeah. 176. Well, I've got the review <laughs> copy. My favorite page. It might have been, it might have been changed. Oh, no, it's the same. It all syncs up. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it says, Mitch Horowitz was raised in a world of Bigfoot stories. Booyah! Okay. UFO yeah, sightings yeah. and Carlos Castaneda. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really like you. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing about UFOs in the book, although I do reference Carlos Castaneda. I don't think I reference Bigfoot, but that was my background. <laughs> uh, I grew up in that world as a kid and uh, came to validate it and explore it as a historian, as an adult. So that's what fueled my own search. Okay. And see, I like that because it gives you a broad base. For, for one thing, you've already got an idea that there are some things out there that make people curious. They may or may not exist, but... They're, that's right. That's that's a different kind of a background when you come to this new thought arena. And so when you talk about yes. the hypnagogia and all that stuff, when you get that into new thought, yeah. all right, well, there yeah. you go. That's uh, all right. That's, yeah, you know, it's extraordinary. These worlds meet up. You know, you were referencing hypnagogia. That's a very relaxed state that we're in just before drifting off to sleep. And very serious psychical researchers have found that that is prime time, so to speak, for episodes of ESP and telepathy and uh, sleep researchers identify it as prime time for impressing the subconscious with suggestions. It's a period of time you can use. I try to be very practical about these things. It's a strange world, and sometimes it bends to our wishes. Okay. I want to back up re real quick because I didn't give you a proper a proper introduction. So if Mitch's voice sounds familiar, it's because he's done voiceovers and he's done books. <laughs> Is that you on Amazon in this book? Because I got the audio. I was listening to Amazon. Is that your voice? Oh, yes. That's okay. me. That's okay. me. Okay. I should know, but <laughs> I just thought maybe I'd clarify. All right. Um, Recorded here in New York City. Yeah. The other thing is that you've also been on Dateline NBC, Sunday Morning, CBS, All Things Considered. You have written for important publications that we all admire. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time, Washington Post says a bunch of good things about you. I'm going to condense that because it's a long thing. David Lynch says, Mitch is solid gold. Okay. All right. I like that. And the Chinese government has censored your work. Really? Yeah, can you believe it? My previous book, One Simple Idea, which was on positive thinking and the history of positive thinking, was published in China, and I was delighted, and they cut about one-third of it. Anywhere that I talked about political figures like Ronald Reagan, who used positive mind philosophy, they cut it because they're very frightened of anything metaphysical getting bound up with politics. Wow. And uh, my, my book is one-third shorter for that reason in, in Mandarin. Well, I was just curious what you know what would have flagged you on that. I, my thought was it's individual yeah. thought. At one point in your book here, it's uh, the, the the power that God is the imagination, and that's that's yes. really a hot button issue. A hot button issue, and you know, in China, any talk of religion is scrutinized. But as soon as religion is used to validate the idea of an individual search or to forward one's aims in the world. Uh, beyond, you know, the most mundane things, or anytime it's bound up with politics, it sets off the censors. And I didn't think they would pay any attention to this book, but they found it and cut out big chunks of it. <laughs> it's like, oh, let's get that yeah. one out of here. All right. We're going right. to take a, a, a quick break, all right, because we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about how this works and the people that you've identified here in the Miracle Club, how thoughts become reality. Mitch Horowitz, Penn Award winning, award winning, I get that. That's a, like a hyphen there. Author of a cult in America. You see, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Okay, I'm sorry. That's my enthusiasm. Right. <laughs> it was I'm Bigfoot. All for it. it was Bigfoot. I want Thank you to you. do some stuff on that. All right. It's, it's, you got you got it. In, you got the chops for it. We're gonna sick oh, you. Oh, let's talk about Bigfoot. Absolutely. Okay, hold on. All right, we're gonna take a break. It's Wendy's Coffee House, KCMO Talk Radio. Wendy's Coffee House, KCMO Talk Radio. My guest, David Lynch, says Mitch is solid gold. That's all you need to hear. There you go. Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> the Miracle Club, How Thoughts Become Reality, Mitch Horowitz. Okay, he's written a lot of good stuff. He's known for having very, very good speaking chops, and I've listened to a few of your shows on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, okay. You are, you are like the new thought guy now that you've kind of, <laughs> you're carrying this. That's me. Okay. All right, so into the book. I'm going to skip to chapter two, right. Power to the People. And this is where you talk about Neville Goddard. And I, I really like his stuff. I've, I've read the other As a Man You Think know Neville. How wonderful. Yes. Wow. Well, I, uh, I'm familiar with these New Thought people. My grandmother. I appreciate it. 
well, hey, somebody pays attention. <laughs> yeah, I feel seen. I feel heard. Okay, good. Okay, good. See, <laughs> my... very validating for me this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my, when I was little, my grandmother said, now, all you have to do, Wendy, if you want something, is draw a picture of it. Because my grandmother had done this, and it worked for her. And so I drew... Brilliant. Don't... Yes, yes, yes. She, she would was... You, would... What? What, what? I'll share a story yeah. about David Bowie. Yeah. Um, when David Bowie was a little kid, this is apropos of what your grandmother taught you and how serious it is, because simple things can be very serious if we really do them and follow them. When David Bowie was a little kid, he used to do these incredibly detailed drawings, not only of himself on stage as a performer, but of the roadies and the band and the audience members and the, the audio equipment and his management standing in the wings. He would create this entire mindscape on paper. This was when he was 11, 12 years old of himself as a performer with all the accoutrements supporting him. And, well, we know that that worked out for him. Absolutely. I don't know if he had that fashion sense back then, but whoa, that took it to like the, the yeah. nth degree with when I've seen some of the costumes he wore and just think, my yeah. gosh, how incredible. Okay. All right. So grandmother told me to draw what I wanted. So from the time yeah. I was little, I drew horses. When I was 11, I got one. It doesn't mean it's like an overnight thing. It's a consistent, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. And somehow yeah. that helped and everything came together. That's remarkable. And, and it's very important that you just indicated that it didn't happen overnight. There was a time interval. There was a period of gestation. And sometimes people think the chapter is closed when the chapter hasn't even begun. Things that come to us can unfold over the course of years. And persistency and patience are very important. When you are yeah. little, your mindset is there. You're thinking all these thoughts. And then people are surprised when these things have gestated for 20 and 30 years. And all of a sudden they get slammed in the face with... I was seven when I thought that. I changed my mind. <laughs> yes. Yes. Whoops. It's absolutely extraordinary how the things that we thought of when we, were, when we were very young can just come upon us in waves. I always ask people to think back to their earliest memories to say age four, age five, when they might have thought of themselves in a certain way, in a certain job, in a certain walk of life. It's extraordinarily powerful. If you really think back, uh, mental pictures that you held when you were very young can come upon you even late in life in very surprising ways. You have had tremendous success, and you also say that, okay, this is a part of it, and um, at first you weren't money-oriented, and then you figured, well, why not? Um, I'm just glossing yes. over, obviously, glossing over. And then you actually say what you're worth now and say, like, okay, it didn't start that way, but here it is. And the way you go, yeah. you address that in The Power to the People, and this is... Um, with again with Neville Goddard, uh, there were some people who wrote, and there was a, a big pile of of letters and stuff that were were given. I can't remember how it started out, but these letters, one of them from a woman who sounded, oh my gosh, her self esteem was absolutely in the toilet and saying things she was yes. worthless. And you you wrote a letter to respond, and I thought that's one of the best parts of the book, your response. Oh, I appreciate that enormously. Uh, these were uh, letters that had been written to the New Thought author, Joseph Murphy, after his death. And I came upon a cache of them. And they were tremendously sad in many cases because people were reciting these affirmations and doing these visualizations, and they weren't getting anywhere in life. And some of them were quite lonely, and some of them had financial needs. And that's part of what moved me to write the book. I love Joseph Murphy, and I love the New Thought movement. I'm part of it. But I feel like it hasn't fully matured. It hasn't fully grown up. And people needed more. They needed more tools, especially tools that can meet people when they are going through periods of suffering. And I wanted to reach out and address these people, even though these letters, in some cases, were you know two or three decades old. I felt like the movement has not responded to everyone's needs. And part of my reason for writing the Miracle Club was, as hopeful and as wonderful as these practices are, they also are due for some growing up for some maturing, for some upgrading. Well, I think that's part of it. There's a lot of stuff out now, like with The Secret and some of these real get-rich-quick kind of things to say, all you have to do is aff write an affirmation and say it 20 times a day or whatever, and it'll, right. it'll happen. And people are they're either stuck, not quite homeless, but financially overburdened or in some yes. way, shape, or form committed, indebted. And this doesn't happen just because you say an affirmation. That's correct. 
One of the things that I write about in the book is the need for New Thought to come to terms with the fact that we live under multiple laws and forces. And I don't use the phrase law of attraction for that reason, because too often it gets used as one overall mental super law. And yet what the materialists don't understand is that the mind does have extra physical properties. And I think there's no denying that in the 21st century. Materialism just doesn't cover all the bases. And that's fantastic enough. The fact that your mind is one tool of causation, among many others, but one tool of causation demonstrates that you are never without devices, even when you're facing the most difficult circumstances of life. And I want people to start there. It's not about a magic formula, and it's not, a, and it's not about fairy dust, but it's about realizing that you do have a tool of causation, an extra physical tool in your possession always, and that is your mind. And it, it's, it's one vital tool among others, and it must not be neglected. That's where creation happens. Yes, and, and creation involves a period of gestation, as you were alluding it can take years, it can take months, or things can happen quickly, but there's a complex of forces going on, and persistency, I tend to use the term pers persistence rather than faith. Persistency is a kind of faith, and it's very necessary. Well, it's like when you're practicing some kind of a, a mental art, like a martial art, they talk about this, Joe McGonagall yeah. talks about it with remote viewing, say it's a martial art, it's the mind over and over and over, training, getting to a flow, getting into a groove, getting yes. into a, okie dokie, we got this, yes, and after, after a while it's just like autopilot. Yes, and it's so important that, that Joe raises that point. Uh, we tend to think of practice and rehearsal only involving motor skills, but practice and rehearsal are also part of using the full potentialities of the mind, which also may be a reason why years have to pass sometimes before something that we've been focusing on starts to actualize, starts to concretize. Okay, there's more in the book, but I want to get into this next break, just with the difference between the way I think, <laughs> or not, and the way <laughs> you think. And present yourself, okay? Because it, it really, when I got on the Facebook, your page versus mine, it just is a, you know, you don't have to be a member. This is where they give you a clue of, of who you're going to connect to if you want to connect and if they let you connect on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so your favorite quote, and we don't have time to do this before the break, okay? But your favorite quote versus my favorite quote, and I couldn't narrow it to one, all right? I, I just like, yeah, okay. there's too much good stuff out there. So, so we will come back after the break. And get into that. But I also want to mention that you do something every day, and I is it 3 o'clock Eastern time? Yes, 3 okay. o'clock Eastern. So 2 o'clock Central and 3 o'clock Eastern, we can all come to a harmonic convergence with Mitch, all right? All That's right. right. Okay, so yeah. we won't mention, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that one. But that, I think, is also a really cool idea, and that goes along with new thought and with the mind. And I think that might be why China is afraid of you. All right. Because one little mind over here is running amok and it could convince millions right. all right millions <laughs> could be influenced so we're going to work on putting our minds together to influence millions and mitch is going to sing along <laughs> all right okay and bigfoot will get in here eventually all right we just i wanted this facebook thing when i saw these quotes i thought that was perfect i'm looking at the clock here and we're running out of time we're gonna have to do the news the good thing is if you're going to listen to this in the podcast form they take the commercials out for now. Okay? <laughs> that's that's one of the things. We pay the bills, so we appreciate it on the radio, but that's the podcast, and you can listen to it, so anything that you miss, you can do that. Wendy's Coffee House, the blog spot, I'll update some of the links that we talk about with Mitch, too, and some of these new thought leaders, because yes, I grew up with this, I'm familiar with this, and I can tell you, it absolutely works, but you do need to acquire one important thing that I came to this earth to learn. Patience! Back in a few, Wendy's Coffee House, KCMO Talk Radio. Wendy's Coffee House, KCMO Talk Radio. You know, I couldn't help it. Bigfoot, I just kind of, you know, was as soon as I saw that, I've got to interview him. I've got to interview him. <laughs> and I'd already had the book. I'd already scheduled it. But I was like, this is a slam dunk. Okay, so Mitch Horowitz, he's very qualified. He's a Penn Award-winning historian, longtime publishing exec. He's got all sorts of clout, okay? So <laughs> I'm really lucky. <laughs> but what I went to immediately was the Facebook the Facebook page, because after all the credits, I, okay, so what's the real guy for? And he, here he is, his favorite quote, Rabbi Joshua Loth Liebman, 1946. There is a chance here in America for the creation of a new idea of God. 
a God reflected in the brave creations of self-reliant social pioneers, a religion based not upon surrender or submission, but on a new birth of confidence in life. That is an absolute slam dunk. I love that because that's what the new thought thing is. It's a confidence in, I got this, I got this. So yes. I really, I, I love that. All right. So I looked at that and I thought, well, how do I, ma- how do I match up? So I went to my quotes because I thought, well, my gosh, that's really good. What did I put on my page? It's been a while. I forgot. So here are my favorite. We'll go to the bottom one because this I thought was a little bit more, it covered everything that I believe. The first principles of the universe are atoms and empty space. I know that. Everything else is merely thought to exist. And that's Democritus. Okay, way back when. B.C. something. Wow. Okay. The other one, Mitakuye, and it's Mitakawe. Yeah, everybody tells me to pronounce this different. Oasin. means we were all related. It's a part of the Lakota prayer. All right? So those are the two. And then I got to the one that probably fits me better than anything else. I went to a bookstore and asked the saleswoman, where's the self-help section? She said if she told me, it would defeat the purpose. George Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> and see, that's now, life. That may be the only instance of Democritus falling under the favor quotation section <laughs> of a Facebook page. You know, everybody else is like, I don't know, you know, Charlie Brown. <laughs> well, or, yeah. You know, uh, I, living I just... on a prayer or something, Bon Jovi. You know, yeah. Democritus. Okay. Like, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, so that's I just, awesome. I... I'm going to... Friends you on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, see, that's the thing. It's There are these little tidbits that we don't get to reveal to the world that come through in the fine print. And that's what may, the... May I share the most, yeah. the most embarrassing favorite quote ever? Oh, that, sure. That a friend of mine used in, in his high school yearbook? Yes. True story. Okay. Nothing racy about this, but it is a true story. He quoted... All the world is indeed a stage, and all the men and women merely players rush. And I had to say, Kenny, you know, someone said that before Rush. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Shakespeare, right? But Rush inserted the indeed, so they took a certain artistic license. And that was Kenny's. They made it fresh. My friend Kenny's favorite quote in yeah. the yearbook. They made it fresh. They Without it- that indeed. I mean, it, it's really never penetrated. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like the to be or not to be. You know, it's all rel- relative. Yeah, related. Right. <laughs> Rush. It's, it's like... Rush said that. <laughs> now, we're going to get back into what you do every day. This is about manifesting. I did an interview with uh, a guy right before you. The baseball gods are real. His name's Jonathan Fink, and he is an investment manager. And his whole book, especially when you look at his little experiments that he does in terms of manifesting something and how it plays out, it kind of goes the roller coaster of, okay, we did this, it went down here, it went up there. And he has one on the World Series experiment where he says game seven. Well, it, oh, oh, yeah, right, huh? it's going to go to game seven. He buys tickets. He, he, that is, he does this example of how these things work and then how they work when he collaborates or you know other people are thinking along the same way. And that, I wow. like, with your stuff, it was like, oh, my gosh, these things just synchronistically fell into place. And it talks about the reality yeah. of working this this process. Oh, interesting. Well, I do think that mental resources can be pooled, so to speak, and that in a certain way, we don't really have the great teachers today, but what we have is the group. And I think the mental energies of the group are absolutely vital to people's sense of advancement and possibility. Well, you talk about with Dean Radin, some of the experiments they've done, and there's another one, uh, oh gosh, oh, female, she did, she did all these, oh. Lynn, Lynn at McTaggart? Lynn McTaggart, of course. Yes, yeah, yeah I've interviewed what, back when I was in Radio 1996 or something, when these people were just starting to get this stuff together, and her intention experiment mm-hmm. was just starting. Those things are mine, when this happens just one time, when somebody gets a hit yes. as a result, they're like, O-M-G. How did that yes, happen? Yes, yes. It's incredible. What a lot of people don't realize, and I go through some of the data in the book, is we have clinical lab evidence of ESP and of the extra physicality of the mind. If we don't have that evidence, then effectively speaking, we don't have evidence for anything because the statistical models that are used in all of our experiments for pharmaceuticals and everything else have been applied to ESP for decades, and they have been juried, and they have been parsed, and they have been 
done over and over to guarantee that there's no pollution in the data. And yet there are certain people in our society who just can't come to terms with the implications, but they will eventually because data wants to be free and this data is there. So the fact that the mind's extra physicality have been established, the greater question facing our generation is how or whether these things can be used in a productive way. So that's part of what I'm probing in the book. Okay, and I want to go, this is the, the mirror man, the centrality of Neville Goddard. Yes. You, you yes. use a quote with the, the Human League, mirror man. Yes. <laughs> off the, you want me to read it? I was going to use Rush, but I changed my <laughs> mind. <as well>. Please, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> the water shines. A pebble skips across the face a dozen times, then disappears. Not a trace left behind. Why that one? Neville believed that we are constantly, from moment to moment, creating our own sense of reality, including perceptions of past, present, future. And things that we feel as being so solid and so permanent are ever-changing all the time. I don't actually use the term manifesting. I, I use the term selecting because, in a way, our emotionalized thoughts, our perspective, our point of view is always selecting from and among an infinitude of possibilities. And Neville believed that we experience these things in an absolutely concrete, real way, and they're ever-changing. And, yeah, I kind of go along with that because it's like you're sitting at your desk and you can pick the book from the third shelf, the book from the fourth shelf, the book from the shelf that doesn't exist yet, but you know it's coming. All right, so that's your reality, yeah. your little bubble of, of potential always happening. The thing is about this, people get frustrated. They get frustrated when things don't happen immediately or when other people diss their their purpose. I'm going to come back. I want to come back and have you talk about that evidence of things not seen. All right. Mitch Hurwitz is my guest. The book, The Miracle Club, KCMO Talk Radio. Wendy's Coffee House. Mitch Hurwitz, you can check out the website because I'm glossing over a whole bunch of stuff here. You can also check him out. Medium, I think, is uh, medium.com. He's right. He writes, and he's got uh, you can a whole lot of YouTube presence. So anything you want to know, you can do your own research. I trust that you are up to this challenge, and it's worth it. Okay. The payoff is if you actually do some of this creative mind, mental math, whatever it is, however you term it, if you practice this and are consistent and believe that eventually in one form or another, constantly improving, something will manifest, you'll get results. Is that a good start, Mitch? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's been observed that the mind is like a muscle, and that's true in all of its dimensions. You have to be persistent. You have to keep going, and things will happen. Chances are something extraordinary will happen, but give it time. You must be exquisitely patient. The challenge with this is when you say it out loud and you tell people, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, if you aren't solid, then one little criticism, you know, reading somebody's yep. diss on Facebook or on Twitter, it's like, yep. and, and it just devolves and immediately, you know, somebody goes into a, a thousand pieces and has a little twinkle fest. Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> with, well, you know, a star that goes, um, that, that is destructive. And so you, one of the things that re you recommend and some of the various things I've seen out is get rid of people who are destructive or who are negative in your life. And this doesn't mean your mother-in-law, but you know, kind of just pull back, <laughs> pull back. It, it could, it could mean your mother-in-law. I was just talking about that last night, actually. <laughs> not, not yours. Yes. Relating to <laughs> my background, but yeah. I, I think that nothing is more important than burning your bridges with cruel people. Cruel people not only sap your energies and your abilities, but they throw off your mental resolve and they distract you with seeking their approval, which will never be forthcoming. But one thing, you always have the choice. You always have the capacity to separate yourself from cruel people. You might not want to live with the consequence, but the choice is there. And it's important for your own sense of self-agency to remember that. You can also separate. You can make the internal vow. And you do this silently. You don't have to go around announcing this to anybody, and it's better not to. You can silently vow to separate within from a cruel person and at the first possible moment to separate physically, even if you can't do it right away. You will feel a new sense of hopefulness and energy in your life. Separating from cruel people is arguably the most important thing you can possibly do for yourself. 
And if you're sensitive, there's an energy that goes along with that. And those are the things I do feel when you're in a room with somebody who's vibrant and joyous and like enthusiastic. It's it's infectious. The same way. When Without you're, question. Yeah. When when you're with the the you know the Linus or the guy who's like. Ee! Well, that also yeah. has a, its own special feeling. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. very special. I always reassure people that the Miracle Club, in effect, is open to everyone, and your membership is secret. You don't have to tell anybody what you're doing, because the point is not to seek anybody else's approval, but these are your private experiments. And you, that's it. You do invite people to come along on the ride. This is how it worked for you, the evidence of things not seen. And that's the quote from Neville about, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. And that when you were, right. you were working on trying to get uh, an audio book, you were just saying, hey, I got I to you know, well, do this. I want to do this. And so how'd that work? Yes. How'd that work? It was amazing. There was an audio book that I very deeply wanted to narrate. And a publisher with whom I had previously worked was just being silent and then said no. And I felt dejected by the experience. But then I went into an exercise of mental visualization. And I followed this exercise for about two weeks very carefully. And not only did the rights to the book that I wanted to narrate migrate to another different publisher, but that same publisher wanted me to do three books and had actually been trying to get in touch with me, but his emails had gone into my deep, deep spam filter, and I had never seen them. And the whole thing just unfolded in this absolutely uncanny way. I didn't do anything outwardly to bring all this about, but I visualized for two weeks, and everything came together. And I not only narrated the book I wanted to narrate, but I came into a relationship with an audio publisher with whom I I now work very closely and regularly. Okay. Can I make a a request? Of course. Anything. A Bigfoot book? Would that, you know? Oh! (laughs) How fascinating. <laughs> I will consider that. You've That'll got, be a departure. You've got but, the voice. Well, it's not I, a departure. In this, it's an expansion. It's like a new wing. Yeah, it's an expansion. I like it. <laughs> I'm going to look into that. Well, okay. I like books on big core topics, so maybe. <laughs> well, you took on Edgar Casey. Yeah, well, not physically, but yes. I have, well, I've okay. I've Edgar Casey. He's a person I admire and love very deeply. The Positive Mind Metaphysics. Of as Edgar Casey, um, right? Mind just builder. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that part is, I think, you know, a, a big element of this. Some of it, and I've had these experiences with things that people don't see and people don't believe in, and I don't care because when I've experienced it right. and I know it's real, <laughs> I give people a template and say, "Look, see for yourself. If you can't experience it, that's not my problem. But if it's out there, right, right. somebody's experienced it, and that's what you're showing people with this methodology." And working with miracles, I want to ask one more question because we're we're running out of time. Please. Miracle, biggest one you've ever experienced? Wow, the biggest miracle I've ever experienced, I have to say, is becoming a writer and becoming a public voice. I didn't publish my first books until I was past the age of forty, and I always want that to be clear to people. This isn't some career track that I was on from the very beginning. When my first book contract arrived home, we had just brought our second kid home from the hospital. I was past the age of 40. I had a corporate job, and this stuff took shape in my life because of years and years of visualizing, affirming, believing, along with a great deal of sweat equity. But the miracle of my life was being able to translate my whole career from a corporate job to a job as uh, a writer, speaker, and narrator, and it didn't occur until midlife. Okay, that gives everybody hope, all right? Uh, yeah, it just, should. Just that sense of we aren't or- Orson Welles. The thing that, about not being Orson Welles and success at 26 is you don't have to live with a, a long term of what if and how. At 40, you've got, yes. whoa, cool, yay. <laughs> yeah, and peaking young can be a very serious burden, as I think it was for Orson. Peaking young... While it can be hugely exciting and feel like a roller coaster, it can also dip. And then you have decades to follow where you've already peaked, and that presents its own burden. Well, and it's not fair to have those kinds of expectations because, again, those are everybody else's expectations. And then when you buy into that, you've yes. lost your, you, you basically you've lost your free will. Yes, that's true. That's true. I counsel silence. I counsel separating from people who are destructive. I counsel keeping your plans 
uh, close, closely held, maybe forming a small group, a support group uh, that with whom you can share your plans. But you don't want to advertise what you're doing to people because human nature is such that others will shake your resolve, and you don't need to vet what you're doing in front of anybody else. Okay, I wish we had more time to work with. We could kind of expand this last minute. You'd get into that in the book about the the time, you know, being able to change things in the past, change this future. So yeah. maybe that'll be a different a different show. And I'd love it. I'd love it. UFOs and Bigfoot. Okay. <laughs> this has been awesome. This has been one of my most pleasurable interviews, and I've done a lot. I think you are just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, and Flat I, out. I don't have any money to pay you, but I really appreciate it. I'm sending you good vibes. That's all I ask. The Miracle Club, How Thoughts Become Reality. Mitch Horowitz, and you'll find out all the new thought leaders and the reason it works and how it works, and he'll give you some instructions on what to rule out and what to rule in. I really, I, I buy into this hook, line, and sinker. I've seen it work. I've seen people recover from cancer, stage four, and say, what was I thinking before this happened? Because they have such a new sense of freedom. MitchHorowitz.com, that's the website. Mitch, what do you got? Anything? I'll end with one word, try. I want everybody to go and experiment. Wendy's Coffee House blog spot. Check the links. Thank you for listening. See ya.